The Air Force, which in 1926 numbered 800 aircraft, was more or less the same size as the British Air Force, but it was only two-thirds the size of the French Air Force. In air power, as in sea power, France was more powerful than Italy. Here, Mussolini selected as his first head of the Air Force one of the four people, the quadrumvirs, who'd marched alongside him in October 1922 in the March on Rome. A dashing, charismatic, young, ex-military officer, Italo Balbo. And Balbo was head of the Air Force until 1933. Now, on one level, Balbo did what Mussolini wanted. In terms of an Air Force as a showpiece, as part of the magisterial development of fascism, both ideologically and practically in Italy, Balbo produced the goods. In the, late 19, in the middle and late 1920s, fascist aircraft competed in the Schneider Trophy, which cost a great deal of money, although they only won it once. More importantly, perhaps, Balbo set out on a series of what were called aerial cruises. Fleets of Italian aircraft flew to Odessa in 1929. They flew to Brazil in 1931. They flew to Chicago in 1932. Indeed, I believe that there still is, or there was at least until recently, a street in Chicago called Balbo Street. Now, what this did was to show the potential reach of air power. And that in itself was something that aided Mussolini. But what it also did was take up valuable resources which could have been spent in other ways. And when Balbo departed from office in 1933, uh, he had many critics. By the end of the 1920s then, Mussolini, whose ambitions were no whit smaller than they had been in 1922, was feeling frustrated. And he vented this frustration in February 1929 to his incoming foreign minister, Dino Grandi. In Dino Grandi's diary in the Rome archives, we read this, that Mussolini says, the old Italy has produced nothing but tenors, mandolin players, and orators. He would give the Sistine Chapel, the Duomo in Florence, and the entire contents of all the national museums for a single military victory. Hopefully, Mussolini added, Providence would before very long, allow Italy the possibility of a fortunate war, short and merciless. So that was what Mussolini wanted, but he was not to get it for another six years. The Depression from 1929 to 1932, 33, it lasted a little longer in Italy, of course caused further restrictions of funds and financial difficulties. The other feature of this period was the demise of democratic Germany and the rise of Hitler and a national and then national socialist Germany. Now this gave Mussolini opportunities, or at least so he saw, for war. Even before Hitler came to power, Mussolini thought that Germany was moving in a right-wing conservative nationalist direction and contacts with higher levels of German soldiers and politicians suggested that they had ambitions in Europe which might conform to his own. So Mussolini thought that when Germany was back on its feet, then it would be a, an aid of some sort in reshaping the balance of power in Europe. Also, Mussolini thought that he could calculate the moments of tension. The first, he imagined, would be in 1930, when the French were due to withdraw from the Rhineland. And looking at the picture uh, early in the 1930s, Mussolini expected, or calculated, that all of this might well lead to a general war in 1935 or 1936. He wasn't ready yet, but we know exactly what he was doing. And we know this from a very unusual source, because his war minister, General Gatzera, kept frantically scribbled notes of every meeting he had with Mussolini. They're the only ones we have, and they're very difficult to read, but they can be read. And on the 29th of January 1931, Mussolini told General Gatzera, we will play the pacifist while we prepare. So that is what Italy was doing uh, from 1931 onwards. 
Well, as I've said, the Conservatives were in charge of the military, and they were looking to create a mass army of basically infantry and artillery. The artillery program was slow and was going to take a lot of time and a lot of money. Probably wouldn't be ready before the middle to late 1930s at the latest. Mussolini, as we've seen, was thinking of war possibly against France, possibly against Yugoslavia, possibly against both of them. The army told him in 1929 that it had no plans for a two-front war, which he'd ordered the year before, and in 1930, it told him that a two-front war would be catastrophic. It was clear that they had to be replaced. At just about this time, a debate developed about the new instruments of war. Tanks, which had been used at the end of the First World War, but also motorised transportation, lorries, which now seem to have, to some in Europe, an equally important place in some future war. These ideas were attractive to Mussolini. And in 1933, he sacked his conservative war minister, General Gatzera, and brought in a younger, newer, and much more enthusiastically fascist head of the army, uh, General Bystrocki, known to his contemporaries apparently as Frederick the Mad. Bystrocki was willing, first of all, to make the army a mo more overtly fascist instrument. He allowed the fascist hymn Giovanezza to be played on parade, and he allowed members of the army to sport their party membership badges, which had not happened before. More importantly, Bystrocki and his successor, uh, General Pariani, in the middle 1930s, developed an idea that was completely new, an idea that Mussolini liked, an idea of a fascist kind of land war, fast, motorized war using tanks, using lorries, using even bicycles, motorcycles, and perhaps even cavalry. After all, Italy was one of the least advanced industrially of all the European powers. This was a very fascist model of warfare. It was called Guerra Brigantesca, brigandish war. Mussolini liked the sound of it. He liked the look of it because it meshed with fascism, and he liked the potential he saw for fast wars. Italy lacked the resources, the power in depth, to be able to last out a long war, but certainly with this new instrument, she might win a short war. The Navy, still short of raw materials, chronically short of industrialized labor, and with very difficult tasks to fulfill, Italy had the third largest merchant navy in the 1930s, continued up until 1934 to build surface craft. But then a change occurred. Curiously, it's a reverse of what happened in the army. A very conservative admiral, Admiral Cavagnari, took over as the head of the navy in 1933. He was a battleship admiral. And in 1934, Mussolini agreed to fund the first pair of 35,000 ton battleships sporting 15-inch guns. Italy was coming to this competition behind France. She was behind, or would be behind, Britain. And it was a competition that she could never keep up. But nonetheless, throughout the rest of the 1930s, Cavagnari pressed for money, built two more of the giant new battleships and modernized two old ones, and presented Mussolini with a view that suggested that the Navy would be able to hold its own despite its inferiority in battleships and in almost everything else. Now, Mussolini only got the war that he wanted in 1935, but it had been a war that had been on the stocks for a long time. Interest in expansion from Eritrea into Abyssinia had developed as early as 1923, and from then onwards, local military commanders were pressing outwards. In 1932, in Rome, the foreign ministry took up the call for expansion in Abyssinia, and the first war plan was developed in that year. The designs produced a conflict which was always latently there between the fascist party on the one hand and the conservative military generals on the other. General Emilio de Bono, who despite his rank was actually a very pro-fascist, was the minister in charge of Africa. He wanted to fight 
a fascist-style colonial war. The tools that he expected to use were moral superiority, mobility, and superior command. The professional military thought that such a campaign required conventional means, the build-up of manpower, the build-up of artillery, and particularly the development of logistical support. Well, by December 1934, Mussolini calculated, partly because of the rise of Nazi Germany, that the international situation was favorable. And on the 10th of December 1934, he gave orders for everyone to be ready for the war by October 1935. With French assistance, Pierre Laval came to Paris in January 1935 and effectively gave Mussolini a free hand in Abyssinia, although historians still quarrel a little bit about exactly how free that hand was. With that free hand and able through his particularly fine intelligence sources to gauge accurately the temperament of Britain in particular, but also of the international community, Mussolini decided to go ahead. And on the 3rd of October, 1935, the Abyssinian War started. 180,000 men, 580 guns, and 130 aircraft took part in the initial war. De Bono ran it at first, but proved totally incompetent. And in November, 1935, Mussolini had to go back to the Piedmontese professionals and put Marshal Badoglio in charge. And Marshal Badoglio proved much more effective. By 4th of May 1936, the Abyssinian War was over. <laughs>